so grateful you've tuned in to Transforming Truth. I'm excited about this series throughout the book of Philippians that we're beginning. This is going to be a message that is within that series. By the end of the series, there should be about 12 messages from those four chapters in this little book that has so much to do with the themes of joy and love and unity. Also has one of the most amazing passages in all of the New Testament concerning what it meant for God the Son to become the Son of Man. And so this book of Philippians study is going to go verse by verse through all four chapters. I'm blessed that you've tuned in. Let's get right into the message that you've selected. Matthew 18, verse 21. Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Will you say bazillion? Say bazillion. There you go. Who owed him a bazillion dollars. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Jesus summarizes the parable and he gives this application. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So some Sundays, um, it's easy, and some Sundays, it's not. But when it's coming out of the Bible, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, I prefer ice cream over broccoli every time. You can tell. But I need the broccoli. I need that stuff. I think this morning, and I don't want to overstate it, but I want to be clear what I believe the Lord is saying. Some of you can get free this morning. I'm almost tempted to say some of you will get free from holding on to those that have wronged you. Everybody in the room over the age of 12 has been wronged. Most of us, many times. And a lot of those times that we've been wronged, it wasn't accidental, it was intentional. The motivation was to inflict pain. The motivation was to misrepresent us. The motivation was to bring us down in something. And when that happens to an individual, it is both a test and an opportunity. The testing is, will we, who know Jesus, act like Jesus when we we are mistreated as Jesus was? Um, The opportunity is that we actually can become more like him determined by how we respond. The most um, undesired promise that Jesus uttered in Matthew's gospel is in this passage. It's the last verse that we read. 
and we can't play around with it. You'll remember the occasion. I'm going to get to Matthew 18 in a moment. You remember the occasion where Jesus was ministering and a young man who had a ton of money ran up to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, what do I need to do to receive eternal life? And Jesus talked to him about the commands of Moses. And the young man, in his ignorance and his overestimation of how holy he was, he said, oh yeah, I've done all of those since I was a little boy. And Jesus looked at him and he says, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Now, that's not my message today. My message is is different, but it's still dealing with this one thing that a lot of Christians lack. It's not selling your goods and giving it to the poor. Some of you are gifted. You're walking in the Spirit. You're living a holy life as far as morality. You have standards that prevent the nasty from the world infiltrating your heart and your mind. You're faithful in your giving. You're faithful in your serving. You love the Word of God. You love to worship. You pray. You fast. And you press into the Lord. But sometimes when everything goes quiet and you're not in the midst of an energized kingdom activity, you feel dread in your soul. You feel heaviness in your spirit. You feel fear in your heart. You're wrestling with something and you don't even know what it is and you've done your checklist of all the things that Christians are supposed to do and Christians aren't supposed to do and you can't figure out what's going on. And I'm going to suggest to you boldly today that you have to consider, is there somebody that you've refused to forgive? Is that the one thing that you lack? We're praying for awakening and revival and breakthrough in this house and in this region. And I have to be bold. It cannot happen until we are a people that are freely forgiving of others. I think um, from a leadership standpoint, it begins with us. If the leaders and their families are coveting and holding on to long ago grudges or even as something as fresh as yesterday and we're refusing to bring it before the Lord in contrition and brokenness and to do what is commanded of us with the other person, I don't think we can reasonably expect awakening. And what's true for the leaders are true for those who follow. And so it's with sobriety in my heart that I'm going to walk us through this passage today because the passage is not to corner us, it's to free us. It's not supposed to feel like chains around us. It's literally supposed to feel like wind under our wings to bring us to a place where God has intended that we live. And so let's take a look at it, and it's not new stuff, and it's not even really that deep. Jesus is using a parable to make a deep principle easily obtainable. And so it begins back up in verse number 21 and 22, and Peter starts talking, and he's going to reveal what I call a common concern among us. In verse number 21, we see Peter's calculating mind. Peter comes up to Jesus and says to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And before the Lord can answer, Peter offers up an option. How about seven times? Now, what many of us don't know is that earlier in this chapter, just right before this scene, Jesus had taught his disciples how to forgive one another. In Matthew 18, you find the the, the principle. This is what Jesus says when somebody wrongs me. Jeff, what you do is you go privately to that person that's wronged you, and you talk to the individual about the wrongdoing. And if that individual repents, you are restored and you've gained your brother back. Then Jesus goes further. He says, but if that individual won't repent, won't acknowledge the wrongdoing, then I want you, Jeff, to go to that person again. This time bring at least one brother with you, maybe two brothers. Bring two other believers with you, and you three go to him and talk to him about the wrongdoing. And if he repents, you've received your brother. But if after the three of you go and he won't repent, then you have to bring the matter before the larger gathering of believers. There's a little bit of intensity to that that literally there's a discipline aspect. You, you tell it to the church. Those are Jesus' words. And when it's told to the church, if the individual doesn't repent of the wrongdoing and the sin, then he is to be in some regard disfellowshipped. 
He is to be put away from the body of believers because he has shown himself unwilling to submit to the Lord and to be restored to the body of believers. Now, at the time that that individual repents, he's, he's fully welcomed back in. So that was the teaching that Jesus gave. And I, my guess is that Peter was thinking about somebody that had done him wrong. Because immediately in verse 21, Peter comes up to Jesus and says, and let me paraphrase here because Peter's kind of just your, he reminds me of just kind of like a blue collar dude, not really polished or anything. And he's saying, Jesus, I got what you were saying right there. Hey, listen, how many times I got to do that? How many times, um, just say I got this brother that's done me wrong. How many times are you telling me I have to enter into that process with him? And then Peter says, about seven times. How about seven times? Now, the reason why that's significant is because the, the, the common teaching of that day in Judaism was that if the rabbis would teach you, if, if somebody wrongs you three times, forgive them three times, but after that, don't, you don't have to forgive them anymore. So Peter doubled it and added one. So Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. Well, I don't know about John and James over there, Lord, but how about seven times? I think I can do seven times. And his world's about to get rocked. So look down at verse number 22, because Peter's calculating mind is replaced in the text with Jesus' relentless heart. You've got to remember, this is Jesus' heart concerning forgiveness. Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. Some translations will have 70 times seven. It's really not a mathematical formula. Jesus is saying two things. Stop counting how many times they've wronged you and stop counting how many times you forgive them. Don't you want to leave? Don't you want to just get out of here right now? I mean, this is, listen, this is, not, this is not easy. Your flesh can't receive this. You, your flesh cannot do this. And so Peter thinks he's being spiritual, and Jesus just shot blocks him. Peter's thrown up a half-court shot. Headed straight for the net. Jesus swoops in and boom, shot blocks it. Seven, seven times now. How about 70 times seven? How about, frankly, Peter, stop counting. And we're talking about forgiveness here. We're talking about the issues of the heart because I know what happens in us when we bring this up. We start thinking of all the variables. Well, what if, what if forgiving them puts me in danger? What if they're and, and we go all through this. This isn't about a restoration and the pragmatic solutions that follow. This is about our heart. This is about freeing, releasing those that have wronged us. And in releasing them, we're actually welcoming the Holy Spirit to release us. We're talking about living free from a heart that is perpetually in offense. Bitterness, anger, resentment, hatred hostility, vengeance, those things can come into our hearts, course through our spiritual veins, and pollute who we are as the people of God. And so Jesus comes with this radical teaching, far more radical than anybody was teaching in his day, and he says, in essence, I don't want you to spend your days keeping a count of how many times you've been wronged by an individual. And I don't want you to keep a record of how many times you've forgiven them. Um, one of the things that we're prone to do is to forgive and remember. <laughs> we're supposed to forgive and what? Forget. We forgive and we remember. We put it in the file. We know how to, well, there's no such thing as files anymore, but we put it in the database. We enter it in, and we, we bring that data back up the next time that person does us wrong again. And Jesus says that's an illegal move in the kingdom. Um, Peter's question is interesting because he's, he's literally asking, oh, gracious one, how much grace do I have to give? That's what he's asking. He, he's literally asking the Lord who has given him so much grace. If, if any of the disciples got grace, it's clear that Peter got it a lot because he was constantly sticking his sandal in his mouth. I mean, he the taste of shoe leather all the time. He just would say things and do things. I mean, it wasn't Judas that Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. It was Peter. And so Peter was constantly getting grace from the Lord. But he's just like we are sometimes. Having received so much grace, he's like, what's, what's, the, what's the minimum I got to give? 
how much do I have to do this? So my guess is that when Jesus dropped the 70 times 7 principle on them, Peter's mouth was hanging open. And so Jesus moves immediately into a parable that's going to help all of us see how God views our call to forgive each other and how he views the situation when we refuse to forgive one another because we are, we are adept at excusing ourselves from forgiving one another. And God just doesn't let us. So stick with me. In verses 23 through 27, he's going to enter into this parable that's a revelation of immeasurable grace. And we have to remember, this is what helps you. This is the grace he gives you. If you miss that, then you're not going to, you're not going to get anything out of the message. This is the grace that he gives you and me. And Jesus wants Peter and all the disciples to see how much grace they've received because that's the motor that powers the engine that allows them to give grace. But if we minimize how much grace we believe we've received from God, then we feel no compulsion to give lavish grace to other people. So Jesus is going to enter into it, and he's talking about you and me. And we begin with an impossible debt. Verse 23. Jesus says, here's the kingdom of heaven for you. This is how it operates. It can be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one account was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. I'm going to walk through the particulars of the parable and, and then we'll come back and apply it. But, but when, when Jesus said, Peter, you've got to forgive a countless number of times. You ask the question, Peter, here's the answer. You can't stop forgiving. So Peter's like, what? And so Jesus enters into the parable here and he's telling his people, you must live in perpetual forgiveness. But why? Because it doesn't sound reasonable. Well, of course it's not reasonable. It's spiritual. It's not of this realm. It's of a different realm. But we were actually born into that different realm through forgiveness, through grace, through mercy. The whole context for becoming and living as a Christian is that we are living in a context of constant grace, mercy, and forgiveness from God. So that's the water we all swim in. And so when the Lord is putting this to Peter, he's like, okay, they're not getting this. L let me give it to you. And so it, the parable involves this guy who owes a king, the highest authority. He's indebted to this king for a bazillion dollars. It's, it says 10,000 talents. A talent was 6,000 denarii. One denarii was a day's wage. So one talent is 6,000 days wage. He owed 10,000 talents. Uh, he's never going to pay it off. He can't work it off. He thinks he can. He's about to protest, but he is hopelessly indebted and he can't get himself out of the situation. And now he's standing before the king to give an account for what he owes. And so you go down into verse number 26 and we see this man give expression to what I call our own ignorant desperation. So the servant fell on his knees before the king, and he's, he's begging him, he's imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. He, he's desperate, but he's still completely overconfident. He, he wants to get out of the judgment, he wants to get out of the king, uh, king's presence, whom he owes this in, immeasurable, impossible debt, and yet he knows he's at his mercy. So he does the only thing a man who's about to be sentenced to death can do. He falls down on his knees physically, the lowest posture. He's begging. He has nothing to offer. He's just asking, give me a little time. I can figure this out. I can make this happen. Whether he believed that or not, he knew that if he didn't get more time, his life's about to end. So he's asking for more time with this, this arrogance that says, I can make this happen on my own. I can figure a way out of this mess. Reminds me of me when I, before I got saved. Uh, and by the way, it's, this is a picture. It's not, it's not kind of subtle. It's very clear. We're the ones that owed the king the immeasurable debt. We're the ones that owed a debt that we can never pay off. A holy God, and listen, I don't think anybody wants to stand up and say, I'm as holy as God is, and I always have been. No, we know. Our, our nature tells us we've fallen short of his glory that we've sinned, 
that we've, you could just take the Ten Commandments and you wouldn't make it through number three before you'd have to say guilty. Because we have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. And because of that, the wage or the payment or the debt of that sin is eternal separation from God. It is spiritual death. And because we've sinned, we have earned spiritual death. We have incurred that debt upon us. We owed God a righteous life, and yet we lived unrighteously. Therefore, we stand indebted to him. And we all know that there's coming a day where there's going to be a final account given. And so many people respond to that kind of thing like, okay, I get it. God's good. I haven't been that good. So give me a little time. I'll figure this out. I'll I'll start going to church. I'll get baptized. I'll quit cussing and watching R-rated movies. I'll only get drunk on New Year's Eve and not the rest of the year. And we start tidying up our morality. And and we start being nice to people. Okay, I'm just going to be nice. I'm just going to be nice. I'm going to be nicer until somebody wrongs you. It's pictured by the servant falling down on his knees saying, I know I, I, I'm not ready to pay this, but give me a little time and I'll, I'll, I'll make some things happen. So here's, here's what happens in the parable. Let's go back to the parable. Something unimaginable happens in verse 27. It's this glorious scandal of mercy. The Bible says, out of pity for that begging servant, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now, just hang with me. The master didn't work out a a manageable payment schedule. The master's smarter than the servant. The servant thinks he's going to get it taken care of. The master's like, you owe me 10,000 talents. Uh, Smart people with letters behind their names say it amounted to it. 200,000 years of of salary. 200,000 years of salary. And the king hears this poor pitiful guy saying, I'll take care of it, I'll take care of it. And the king, out of his own heart, out of compassion and pity for the ignorant, indebted man, looks at him and he says, you know what? Your only hope is me. I forgive everything you owe me. Don't try to pay a cent. I forgive you. And you know what? You're free. Go in your freedom. You're free. I, the king, have taken all of your debt, everything that you owed me, and I'm not even going to put you on parole. I pardon you. You're free. And the servant in the parable walks out of the king's palace. I'm not going to rush past this because I I want us to get this. That is exactly what happened to you when you came to Jesus Christ as a sinner who was lost. He looked at you not because you had potential, not because you were gifted, not because you were super sincere, not because you started cleaning up your act on the way to him. He looked at you and he said, it's in my heart to look at you in your helpless estate, knowing you will never rescue yourself, knowing you can do nothing to even begin to make a dent in what you owe me. And I choose to forgive you as you bow before me. I set you free you are pardoned. It's what he did with you. Now, here's the problem. If there's a problem, here it is. We don't realize how much we owed him. We we really don't. You know why? Because we're looking around and we can always find somebody that clearly owed him more than we did. Right? We look around and like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I got saved as a kid. I really wasn't that bad. And, you know, I mean... I've always, I've I've had people every year, I'll I'll meet somebody, hey, tell me about your experience. When when did you become a Christian? I've always been a Christian. (laughs) Boop, 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 boop. (laughs) That is not true. 
We underestimate what we all owed. And let me tell you, it's not that we have to think of ourselves as horrible, wormy, terrible, depraved, wretched, ungodly, hellish people. That's not how you come to terms with how much he's forgiven, forgiven you. You don't look at how bad you are, you look at how good he is. And when you start seeing him as he reveals himself in the word, and you start seeing his love and his mercy and his goodness and his kindness and his holiness. <laughs> the biggest issue is that we overestimate our goodness and drastically underestimate his holiness. So good. Wow. And when you don't know that God is as holy as God is holy, then you think, yeah, he forgave me. Yeah, he sent a son for me. Thanks. Thanks, Jesus. Thank you. I'll take it from here. I, I don't have the ability to convince anybody. That it has to come by the spirit of wisdom and revelation for you to understand how much you've been forgiven. From God's perspective, every conversion is a violent wrenching away of a soul from the kingdom of darkness. Every conversion. My sweet little kids both got saved early in life. They're so sweet, and I baptized them. And, you know, we just like to think of our, our sweet little kids. Let me just, I'm just going to go ahead and say it again. In the chest of every child beats the heart of a savage. It's Bible. It's Bible. But that's not really the route that we go to try to make people fall in love with Jesus. It's, kind of, it's, it's just... It's, it's foolish to try to help people fall in Jesus by screaming at them how rotten they are. It's just stupid. No. We, when we are approaching people with the gospel, of course we have to mention their need and we have to recognize the issue of sin, but we don't, the Bible says the goodness of God leads to repentance. Not us screaming at people about how depraved they are. And so when somebody is aware of their fallenness, and by the way, most people, you don't have to twist their arm to get them to acknowledge that, yes, they're, they're sinners. Most people, most people won't protest that. And at some point, they become aware of the grace and the mercy and the goodness and the love of God. And when those two things, awareness of God's holiness and awareness of our sin, meet, there's this awesome explosion called conversion. When that believing sinner says yes, to the king the the master just changed this guy's life completely radically radically set him free so we assume the dude's gonna go out and with a brand new lease on life and he's going to be telling everybody about the joy of the king and the mercy of the king and the goodness of the king and the glory of the king he's gonna be bragging on the king He's going to be just as one who has escaped the ruin of, of the rest of his life and has been granted a second chance at living. He's going to want to tell everybody about the king and his magnanimous heart that forgave all of this impossible debt, but that's not what he does. This man takes this glorious scandal of mercy that has been poured upon him and he treats it with contempt. How do we know that? How do we know that he really didn't get it by the way he treated others? So let's go there. Here is the illustration, the second half of the parable. I call it an illustration of gospel amnesia. We forget the gospel. We totally forget who he is and what he's done for us. It can happen to the most dedicated believer in the room. And that's why we have this in our, our Bibles to help us remember. No, 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 no. The forgiven become forgivers. And so look with me. Here's an unavoidable reality for those who are forgiven. If you're here and you're saved and Jesus has washed your record clean and you're, you've become a new creation of Christ, you're going to experience this. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him. And Jesus adds 100 denarii. It's about four months worth of salary. 
three to four months. A comparably very small debt when this dude had just been forgiven an impossible debt. But you're going you're gonna to have this. This is an unavoidable reality. You who have been forgiven are going to encounter people that owe you. I'm not even talking about money. I'm talking about they did you wrong. The debt stands for those that owe us something, that took something from us, that caused a deficit in our lives. And this individual goes out, and it's almost like on the front steps of the king's palace, he sees some guy that owes him, and it's not a, it's not a dismissed sum of money, but compared to what just happened in the palace, it's, it's really ridiculous. And the Bible says that he encounters this man. Now, we love to think that the proper response would be, brother, I know you owe me four months, but guess what just happened to me? I just got relieved of all my debt, and so you know what's going to, it's just on me now. I'm going to release you from your debt, and you over there from your debt, and you back there, you owe me a week's worth. Don't worry about it. We're free. He doesn't do any of that. Look down at the end of verse 28 and go into verse 30. He, he, he shows us this failure to release what he had received. So he seizes him. He begins to choke him. Remember, this is Jesus giving the parable. And as he's choking the man that he's got a hold of, he says, pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. So he releases the guy, and the fellow servant falls down and pleads with him. It's the exact same thing that this guy just said to the king. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, you've got to hear me on this. Jesus is revealing the heart of God and God's perspective on what it looks like to God when we, the forgiven, refuse to forgive. This is God's way of seeing it. It, it feels weird to us because we're like, come on, man, that's a little dramatic. It's God the Son giving the parable to teach them what it looks like when we won't forgive the 70 times 7. And so what does it look like? It looks like us having been forgiven uh, an immeasurable sum because God is holy and we're not. And the holy, perfect God forgave us, the fallen sinner, everything through the blood of Jesus Christ. He pardoned us and he set us free. And we go out and live our lives and we encounter wrongdoing and we encounter mistreatment and misrepresentation. And we encounter negativity from other people. They might talk about us. Maybe they hurt us. Maybe they sued us. Maybe they, they, they ran their mouth about us. It could be an ex-spouse. It could be a parent. It could be a child. It could be a boss. It could be a pastor. It could be anybody. But what they owe us compared to what we owed him is, is not even worthy to be compared. And Jesus says, yet yeah, to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when y'all won't forgive each other, we view it as you going and taking each other by the throat, demanding payment, and forgetting, having gospel amnesia, that when you pleaded with me to forgive you, I said yes. Do you see what the Lord does there? He views our forgiveness of one another not as a matter of justice between each other, but he views it as the measure by which we treasure how much he has forgiven us. You say, well, Jeff, it's not just, and God is a just God. Right, I, I agree with that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about your heart being free. We're talking about us not living like somebody owes us something. We're talking about we who have been forgiven by the king in a measurable psalm living like it. And this guy just had nothing in him for that. We see it in the parable. I mean, don't you want to just, you know, be on the 12-person jury for this guy? It'd be unanimous. The verdict would be in in three minutes. Yeah, this guy acted in a way that was wrong. And we indict him while we excuse ourselves. So verse number 31 this is, this is how it comes back to the attention of the king. It's a clear exposing of this inequity in the kingdom. The fellow servants saw what had taken place. So everybody's watching. 
and they were greatly distressed. They knew it was wrong. And they went and reported to their master, that's the king, all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, now listen, this is Jesus giving this. Don't, don't go home and say, man, that preacher was mean today. This is Jesus. You wicked servant. And then he tells him why you can call him wicked. He goes, I forgave you all that debt because you asked me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant just like I had mercy on you? Jesus actually makes our unforgiveness of each other about him. He makes it about him. We make it about the person that owes us, that did us wrong. We've got the facts, man. We, we, we have got it memorized. We, we could give you Greek and Hebrew on why they owe us. We've got it down pat. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm not making it about you and her or you and him. I'm making it, son, about our daughter, about you and me. That's exactly what he goes, hey, the reason why you have to go forgive them is because I forgave you. I know it doesn't feel right, but it is right. And so that's why our spirits can squirm under this. Because we're thinking to ourselves, that's, that's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's incomplete. It feels like somebody's getting over on us. Well, they might. Yeah, they, they actually might. But they're still not the issue. The issue is, are we revealing a proper value of what we've been forgiven? In our, in our testing time when we have to forgive others. And so the king chastises him, says that his actions are wicked, and um, we, can, we can hear the bell tolling. It's not going to be a good day for him. And so we get down into this verse 34 and 35, and here's this kind of cryptic warning from Jesus. And we have to consider this. So the parable ends, verse 34, and in anger, what about happy God? What about chuckling God? What about pat me on the head and say, oh, it's okay, God? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Um, the Greek word translated jailers here actually kind of dilutes the intensity. This, this word refers to um, a jailer that would afflict and implement torture and pain. It is an intense word. It is, it is a jailer who takes delight out of hurting the prisoner. And watch this. Now, by the way, God is not the jailer. Get that. You, you got to make sure you're interpreting the parable right. God is the king who releases the unforgiving person to the tormentor until the debt is paid. What do we do with this? Okay, so in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, there are two men that Paul mentions. I think it's Hymenaeus and Alexander. And he mentions them to Timothy, and he says, I had to turn these guys over to Satan. They were brothers, not physical brothers they were christians he said i had to turn them over to satan so he could destroy their flesh in first corinthians chapter number five there's an unnamed individual that refused to repent of sin and paul said yep had to turn him over to satan for the destruction of his flesh what in the world is that i believe it's the same thing that is being referenced here in the parable Jesus isn't the one tormenting and destroying. God the Father is not the one tormenting and destroying. In the parable and in those two selections from 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Timothy chapter 1, you have a principle that when there is unrepentance, and by the way, unforgiveness is a sin, that there is some undefined way God releases some portion of us and leaves it wide open, for the enemy to come in. And when the enemy comes in, it's to destroy our flesh. Paul would write in another, no, it was Peter, I think, that wrote in another place, maybe 1 Peter 4, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
So what, what do we do with this? Jeff, what are you teaching here? I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a pretty sober warning that in this parable, the unforgiving individual was released into the jailer's custody and the jailer torments him until the debt, debt is dealt with. I believe in my years of experience, I have seen that bitterness and unforgiveness is by far the number one source of torment, mental, emotional, and spiritual torment to those that I've counseled. counseled. And I, most of the time, I counsel most of the time, probably 90% of the time, I'm counseling Christians. Pastor, I'm depressed. Pastor, I have fits of rage. Pastor, I can't quit drinking. Pastor, I can't quit sleeping around. Pastor, I hate myself. Pastor, I hate my family. Pastor, I don't have the peace of God. I, I, I know this is my fifth appointment like this month, but I still don't feel like I'm saved. And there's this expression of inner torment that looks a hundred different ways. And the more I've been allowed to probe and work with people in those scenarios, inevitably, a lot of the time, not every time, not every depression, not every struggle is associated to unforgiveness, but a lot of it is. And you come back to this place where you find the wound and you realize that's the source. And you address the unforgiven wrongdoing against the person. And unfortunately, I've met people that have said, I'm not going to forgive him. I am not going to forgive her. And I can't say 100 times out of 100, but I'm going to tell you, it's not zero out of 100. Where I think of this and I'm thinking, the Lord in his grace and mercy is seeking to bring you to a place of repentance in forgiving others. And the reason why you have no peace, the reason why you are tormented, is because your refusal to repent has led the Lord to the decision to take his hands off, and in comes the enemy. You see, God doesn't torture us. God doesn't harm us. He doesn't have to. That's not his nature. But when we assert our independence against him and we say, uh-uh, the Lord says, in essence, do you really want to be independent of me right now? And we say, on this area, I'm not forgiven. The Lord says, so be it. And he gives us our independence. And when we have that separation of fellowship, the enemy moves in. That's the way it works. Jeff, I don't know if I believe that. Then let me give you the last verse, and we're just going to close with a time of prayer. See, the parable comes to an end, but the reality continues. Jesus stops the parable, and he gives the application of the parable. He says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus said that, not me. What, now, look at verse 34. What did the master do? He delivered him to the tormentors. The king didn't take out a torture device and torture the guy. He just gave the guy to the tormentors. Jesus says, that's what my heavenly father does when you refuse to forgive. Do we get it? Do you get the heaviness of it? This is not some fringe, you know, doing gymnastics with the scriptures. It's plain as day. Nobody, nobody has Matthew 18, 35 as their life verse. This is, not, this is not the image of God that, that we, we go around, you know, evangelizing with. But friends, I'm talking to believers. I'm, I'm going for the, for the well-being of your soul. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people that have expressed confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord and have bowed their soul. And, and, and those of us that have received lavish grace, and all of us have lavish grace, Crazy grace, immeasurable grace, grace that when we get to heaven, we're going to say, oh, I had no idea it was that much. Why? Because we're going to see him in his holiness. And we're going to say, oh, how we underestimated the amount of grace that was given to us in our life. And when we go out and a fellow sinner, fellow human, wrongs us and we shut down the flow of that grace we say in essence 
I want as much as I can get from me, but I ain't giving any of it to her. That's how God sees it. So the question is this. Does this mean if we don't forgive, we go to hell? Is that what you're teaching us, Jeff? I don't think it's the right question. I don't think we make it about where we go. I I think the question for all of us is, what does it reveal about how we value Jesus when we do not forgive others? I will say this. Forgiveness of others is a necessary condition for salvation because it is a necessary consequence of salvation. So in other words, the right question is not, hey, can I still go to heaven if I don't forgive this person? It's the wrong question. The question is, does my unwillingness to forgive them signal that I've never been forgiven? Does my withholding of grace mean that I don't have the power that comes from grace because I've not experienced it. I know this. Every one of you have been done wrong, and this is hard. It's very, very hard. That's why Jesus told us at the onset, you're going to have to follow me with a cross on your back. You're going to have to die to yourself. And part of that dying to ourself is that we do not withhold forgiveness, strangle people that owe us, that took from us, that wounded us, that hurt us. We do not demand justice now. We can't. Why? Because he didn't give us the justice that we deserved. We we were on the wrong side of justice. And he gave mercy. And he gave grace. And when that becomes real to you, I'm not saying it's gonna, you'll ever be glib and flippant with it. Our hurts are real. Violations against us are real. Consequences of that are real. But I'm going to tell you, they are not more real than Jesus Christ alive in you, working to will and do of his good pleasure. And he's the forgiver. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet.